Hello, hello. <laughs> Welcome the folks who have already joined or have been hanging out in the waiting room to operational analytics for marketing. We're gonna give folks another three or four minutes to join. Um, on your screen, you should see a completely unrelated icebreaker question of what is your favorite smell and also where are you from uh, to answer in chat. And uh, we'll kill some time going through that, but uh, yeah. <laughs> We got about 22 folks, which is great. Um, there's also a poll for you to answer as well if you want to head on over to the poll option. Um, and we'll get started here in a little bit. Uh, to start off, we can. Perfect timing. I'm sure she'll be back uh, in time, folks. There we go, back. Um, <laughs> it kept me in the meeting, just made me disappear from you all. Um, in the meantime, we can kind of chat through a round of intros and our answer to this uh, ridiculous question ourselves. Uh, so Trevor, who heads up growth marketing here at Census, do you want to start with where you're from and what your favorite smell is? Sorry, what? I think I might be getting feedback. Okay, no, we're good. Um, I'm from Portland, Oregon. I currently live in Portland, Oregon. Thanks to the uh, wonderful remoteness of, of census. Um, and it is a very Portland thing to say that my favorite smell is roses. Uh, I just went to the Rose Garden last week. No roses yet, but it's gorgeous. If you haven't been to Portland, it should be on your list of places to go. It's, it's very, very, very pretty. People are quite nice. Food's delicious. So. And join, let's make a census office up here. The constant effort for uh, for more Portland census folks. Uh, that's a whole campaign, so that's good. Um, and just for a little bit of context on where this question came from too and why it's the, uh, the official census icebreaker. Uh, if you don't already know, we run a Slack community for data professionals and ops folks who want to be better with their data and kind of learn how to be more strategic and improve their impact organizationally. Um, it's called the Operational Analytics Club, and I'll drop a link to it here in the chat in a second. Um, but we host virtual coffees to kind of talk through uh, prompts and like recent articles and podcast episodes or topics that the community chooses every two weeks. And last week, uh, while Trevor was running it, this question came up uh, and it was very popular and there was a whole live slacking of it uh, as everybody went through all their options. So this is now apparently our, uh, our official icebreaker. Um, uh, yeah, Jeff, do you want to go with your location favorite smell? <laughs> sure. Um, hey, everybody. I'm, I'm Jeff. Um, I'm based in New York City, and allergy season is very real right now. So right now, my favorite smell would be anything. Um, but if I had to make a choice, um, it would actually be the smell of coffee. Even before I was a coffee drinker, I always loved coffee-scented things. Um, and uh, yeah, just a very rich kind of like reminds me of waking up. It's nice. A hundred percent. Also, one of my favorite smells, uh, and I was just telling uh, Trevor and Jeff before this, Petrichor is probably mine, which is the smell of like the desert after it rains. Um, it has to do with like the Korea soul, Korea soap bushes. I can never remember which is which, uh, but and the bacteria that's in the soil and everything too. Um, but yeah, let me drop the link for the community here in Slack um, or in chat so everybody can join uh, if you aren't already in it. Uh, and then we'll give folks like one more minute uh, until five after and then we can get started. Okay, good time to also say that uh, I think this Friday, uh, tentatively, if, if we have people that are interested in joining, we'll do an AMA on the topic on Friday. We do every other Friday, we have a, a coffee chat. So if you're not feeling like you get enough Zoom in your life right now, you can have a Zoom chat with, I think, actually, I think they're quite, they're the best Zoom chats of my week. I think that's safe to say. And there's probably people in, in here who can attest to that. Let me see if we can find, maybe, maybe not. I don't know. But um, no, there's Josh. Josh can attest to that. Um, yeah, they're fun. You should join. <laughs> Thank you, Josh. That's all we need. 
<laughs> um, awesome. Well, we are right at time, so I can start us off. Uh, as our title slide says, as the registration says, as I said a few minutes ago, today we're talking about operational analytics for marketing. Um, we have Trevor, who is responsible for growth marketing at Census, as well as our product manager, Jeff Sloan, here, too. Um, I'll hand it over to Trevor to basically run the show, uh, and Jeff and I will be available in chat to answer some questions throughout, and then we will do a Q&A session at the end uh, to kind of dive a little bit deeper before we wrap up. Uh, so with that, Trevor, go ahead and take it away. All right. Uh Thanks everyone for joining. Uh, I hate presenting, but I'm gonna do my best here. So uh, as much as you can, please ask questions because it'll make me feel like I'm not just doing this by myself here. So uh, let's go for it. So marketing is easy as everybody knows, right? Um, it's, it's, it's pretty simple. We, we do three things. We identify and expand new opportunities. We improve the efficiency uh, of the customer acquisition process and we uh, increase customer value. It's, it's not terribly hard. Uh, the experimentation process we have is, has been known since like the lean startup. Um, it's pretty easy to brainstorm and develop new ideas and um, iteration will get you there over time. So we can kind of trust this process. But in practice, it's a fucking hackathon. And I think anybody who's dealt with MarTech tools in, the, in their career kind of understands this. And that's a, lot, that's a lot of what we're gonna address today. It's really hard to run big experiments because we have a lot of tools that touch a lot of different parts of the customer journey. And when we evaluate these experiments, it's, um, it's hard to evaluate them because we have every tool has a different way of measuring things. Um, and also the tools themselves are built to do just one thing. So whether you're looking at the website or, or email automation or, or ads, you get a single lens of, of a certain part of the customer journey and that makes it fragmented across all your tools. And finally, every platform wants to be the platform. Zendesk, pretending it's a CDP, Klaviyo, HubSpot, Salesforce, everybody has become a CDP without a, the acknowledgement that like, maybe they're not good at all these things. They offer all these things, but it's, they're really just kind of like so-so at everything in the end. So as a result, uh, metrics for optimization lack continuity and consistency, especially if conversions take a long time or happen in a place where you can't e easy, easily register them. I just lost my notes here, so bear with me. So you end up with an unholy, unintentable spreadsheet reporting system or a BI tool if you're lucky to smash together a cohesive picture of your experiments just to optimize the tools individually because they have no idea about the broader system. Integrating metrics across tools feel like a duct tape solution at best. So if you've experienced this, you're in the right place. Uh, and I want to propose, Census wants to propose a solution. This is uh, the, the, the Word crafting of Ali, this, the Ali that's in this, uh, that, that introduced this chat. Operational analytics is an approach centered on building a shared understanding between teams based on trusted, highly accessible data from your data warehouse. In other words, it's, it's a good way to get consistent metrics across your entire customer journey and every tool in your stack. So we can look at a pretty typical SaaS marketing stack. There are a bunch of ads platforms, a web analytics tool, an app analytics tool, a marketing automation tool, and a CRM. And we kind of have to, we expect customers to kind of navigate their way across all these lenses in one cohesive picture, but very often that's unrealistic. Um, each, each of the tools manages a different scope of the customer journey. Each offers a specific solution for a specific team. Each focuses on metrics that are related to that solution. And as you've probably experienced, this can create a disjointed customer journey externally and internally, it can create a lot of confusion and pain. I think everybody has the experience of having the same exact metric defined three different ways and three different tools for three different teams. So what operational, what I'm gonna propose that operational analytics can do is give you a little bit better freedom to design better metrics. The data warehouse has access to all the data that you have about your company, or at least should, and allows you more con control of, of your, over your metric definitions. And then on top of that, it will help you create continuity across your stack. So by using census to move your data into the tools and the, and the metrics into the tools that you use every day, it'll just 
give a lot better continuity and, and a wider surface area for, for trusted metrics. So let's scope this down to a specific example. Um, I think we marketers are very familiar with the entire customer acquisition process. We have a lot of tools that do awareness. Um, Google ads is, is a very common one. We measure uh, targeting or we manage targeting and bidding in that platform. And we use Google Analytics to measure how people are engaging with the website. Um, and, and then we have HubSpot to, to kind of capture and, and move leads through the like process of engagement. And so um, thankfully, at Census, I've been interviewing a, a lot of candidates lately for, for marketing roles. And um, it's amazed me how many people want to leave their current jobs because the metrics they are, are using are just utterly useless. Um, I think everybody has this sense of like, people want me to drive clicks or people want me to drive leads. Um, but it, it, it's, it's, it, every, it, it basically there's like this idea that there's just like, we get clicks, we get leads and magically we create them into revenue. So we have metrics around cost per, cost per impression, cost per click, cost per conversion, cost, cost per lead. But unfortunately none of this takes into consideration the most important uh, factor, which is quality. So it makes it easy for everyone to succeed individually, but fail collectively. So one thing I, I just want to, as a PSA, as, a, as part of this is like narrow part of this TED talk, basically, I wanted to pr propose that we use just better metrics and do ourselves a favor. And you know, like if, if, um, if, if VPs or, or, or founders are, are giving, you, uh, uh, giving you flack on this, I mean, it's probably worth your time to invest um, the social capital into make, making the effort to change the way that people think about metrics. So I got a few hints on good metrics. Um, good metrics are either process or product metrics. I don't think this is a hard and fast rule, but like there are metrics that help you understand the inputs that you're, that you're putting in. So impressions, clicks are largely uh, an input, input to this. And then product metrics, product metrics, product metrics, which is a little bit of a misnomer, but uh, it is the product of your work. So in most cases, this would be revenue, customers, um, churn, things like that. Good metrics are paired with context. So segmentation is a, uh, will signal why a metric look, looks a certain way. I think everybody um, has seen the, the, the big spreadsheets that executives use to say, hey, we got all these leads, but like, you know that there's like 12 different stories between this whole bu bunch of leads. And, um, and it's in those in the segmentation where that the truth is found. And then additionally, ratios will signal, signal if a difference between two segments is, is, um, is, is meaningful. So probably for this audience, it's not uh, terribly enlightening, but um, it's worth mentioning again. And then finally, and I think most importantly, good metrics balance action and revenue. So we need to find metrics and create metrics and, and get people to buy into metrics that are faithful both to the thing that they're measuring and close enough to rev revenue to be meaningful, uh, to have a meaningful impact. So that means for, for wherever we are, for whatever effort in the customer journey that we're measuring, we need to make sure that it's relevant to the thing um, that we're the lever that we're moving, but also has some tie eventually to uh, with with confidence to to an impact on revenue. So my, this this whole thing today, um, I got halfway through my slides here, thankfully. Um, so uh, the, the, the idea is that I want to introduce a framework about thinking about marketing metrics so that we get metrics that are appropriate for each stage of the customer journey and are suited for every tool and ultimately all relate back to revenue. Um, there's also a technical component to this um, and it's, <laughs> it's why Census is sponsoring this, this webinar is to uh, show you how Census can move the, these metrics from your data warehouse into all your, um, all your marketing tools. So there's three parts to the rest of the kind of the meat of this talk. Um, the first one is, is creating a model, and I'll describe a little bit what, about what a model is. Creating a score uh, that we will use to, uh, to translate across the entire customer journey. Um, and then finally, the third part of creating continuity across all uh, the customer journey and all your tools. 
So the first thing is uh, creating a model. And I think, I mean, I don't really have any good reason to, to put a picture of Mr. Rhino here. Here's my dog who's sleeping uh, in the house right now. Uh, he might wake up any time and start barking, but so, so bear with us. But um, a model is a table that represents a noun. So I'm, I'm using Rhino to exemplify a, a noun as a dog. Um, I think of every, every uh, um, every row in the model to be a singular dog. So rhino would just be a row. Um, and then uh, fields are, are, are kind of like features. I think there's this movement to start to think about data products as proper products. I think we should think about the tables that we create, the models that we create as, as actual products with features that, um, with fields that are features that can be prioritized, scoped and tracked um, and, you know, Jeff would probably be able to tell you he's got a big backlog for figuring out how we, we do data pipelines and stuff. Um, similarly, when we work internally and to create models that are going to serve different purposes uh, with census to, to shoot out to different tools, we need to think about what are our most important fields in what order and, and what effect will they have and prioritize that way. So also just want to kind of like share some ideas on field types that are important for um, for, for operational analytics models. Um, the first, obviously most important is, is the identifier. So this is gonna be a customer ID, an email address, a uh, domain, uh, a, like a segment uh, anonymous ID. The second subset would be scoring, like um, prediction scores, churn, score, churn prediction scores, um, revenue modeling. Um, the third one is filtering. So uh, if, for example, if Rhino is a black dog, there are brown dogs, there's yellow dogs. And having these, having these fields and tables allows people who are non-technical to go into census and filter in, uh, in the segments UI to create audiences off those um, filtering mechanisms. The fourth is personalization. So um, a simple case statement can map, um, can map values into predictions to or, or or suggestions about um, about the rows in your model, and you can then use those things, uh, those those personalization kind of words or tokens to improve your emails and um, and any type of messaging that you're you're using with segment. So, for example, like uh, we know since Rhino is a pug that he probably enjoys sleeping, uh, and then. Analyticals the next time. So this, I think it's it's really useful to have your analytical metrics in your models that you're using for operational analytics because then you're reporting from the same table that you're emitting into the tools, and it kind of creates a a, a feedback, a nice feedback loop. And finally, um, foreign keys. So any any type um, you need to tie two tables together, you have to have foreign keys. Like this is no surprise to anybody who's done uh, data modeling before. Um, finally. The identifier and the granularity must match the destination. So, if we're talking, if we're um, sending data about companies back to HubSpot, the identifier should be a, a domain name or an ID for the company. Or if it's for um, for anything that happens in Google Analytics, we have to have like a user ID or some ID identifier in Google Analytics that we can match to from the data warehouse. Finally, um, start small. Models can just be a single column. You could have a single column of email addresses and you can push it out to uh, Facebook or Google ads as a first party um, audience for, for marketing. I needed a breath here. That was a lot of talking. So here's a picture of Rhino. <laughs> so this is, is, is uh, how, how we're gonna kind of move them from a single model into a number of the, the different uh, destinations that we're going to talk about today. So on each of these, there's a different uh, identifier column on in Google Analytics and uh, HubSpot. It's the domain and um, that's paired with the score. And in Google Ads, it's a GCL ID. So when we're sending conversions to Google, uh, Google Ads, we need to have a record of the GCL ID so that we can append to it the data about that um, conversion. The second part is creating a custom, customer prediction score for qualification. Um, this is, uh, I, look, I, I should be the first person to say that I'm a, not a data scientist. I'm not a, um, a, a machine learning expert. And I'm also not a, like a AI ethicist here, but 
there's a lot you can do with the 80 20 rule. And I, that's what I want to, to show, show you here today is that um, we can, we can go a long way by identifying the, process, uh, the, the attributes of people who have seen success with our marketing programs um, and, and seeing what, how those cor correlate to revenue. So what you can take, and I'll show in the next slide, um, you can basically aggregate and amalgamate uh, different properties um, for B2B, which would be like the geography, the size of the company, the age of the company, revenue industry and technologies that they use are, are often very good signals of um, whether they're appropriate fit for your company. Or for if it's B2C, you can get um, geography, age, device, interests, and education. I think one thing to note is it is quite crazy how much data you, is available to buy out there. And the better quality, the more data that you can get into any model is going to improve the, the predictiveness of that model. Um, and then finally, again, uh, start small and iterate. I wanted to shout out quickly uh, to, to a couple um, friends of Census. Uh, one is Clearbit. Um, Clearbit is a B2B enrichment tool that we use. And I'll show you how we do that with Google Analytics here pretty soon. Um, but it, it allows you to enrich, enrich, uh, data, enrich uh, Google Analytics data with data about the companies. Uh, and then we use it in the warehouse and then we kind of bring them back together with census. And fin finally, uh, continual is a basically a prediction in a box for, for data warehouses. And those people could probably explain a lot better, but once you get more sophisticated in, with your predictions, you can start to think about um, using a tool like continual. So I, 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 I wanna share this, but I, I don't wanna say that like this is the best thing to do because um, it, there are reasons uh, to be, you don't want to be like overly predictive because it, it can force you into think, just um, being too caught up on, well, you'll get too narrowly focused on things and, and you will not uh, be able to look outside that if you create a, two, uh, a, a, a score that is too, too predictive per se. Um, but this is a, a model that I use that I, I took each, um, each segment over here, like the different country segments, the different size ranges, age ranges, and employee ranges, and just conversion rates across these in different tables. And then I, um, for each one of the companies in the main, uh, in the companies table, I just averaged those together and then created a score, like a, uh, a score between zero and hundred based off of that. And what I found is that in, within 40% of, of the, um, of all the companies, I found that I'd it, when I ranked them, 40% of the companies showed 77% of all the customers. So it was moderately predictive. That doesn't sound like a lot, but it also got rid of the bottom 40% that we probably don't want to target anyways. We don't necessarily want to engage them. We're kind of wasting our time and, and money there. Um, and it focuses uh, the, the money and efforts towards those that are more likely to become a customer. So finally, and I think probably the most interesting part is creating con continuity. So the first thing is you want to maintain your models. This is not some, like a set it and forget it thing. You will want to make sure that new data is, is getting into your models appropriately. When data is changed, you, you should do yourself and your team's favors to kind of keep those up to date. Um, the second one is translate each metric to the, the context of the tool. I'm going to get into that in a little bit here. Um, and then educate teams about how metrics translate across contexts. So um, I think this, you know, common example is just like a conversion rate versus revenue. Some people care a lot about revenue, but don't understand why conversion rate matters. And, and then there's, we, we're unable to um, have reasonable conversations because the context isn't shared. Uh, then some just good advice on um, on creating continuity um, and adapt metrics to the place in, their place in the customer journey. So sometimes you want to have a you want to favor signal over noise. So lower funnel, you want to think about like I want really strong signal because there's fewer of them, um, or higher in the funnel, I want a lot more signal because I I can't really predict how far this this audience is going to get down the funnel. You want to balance automation versus human interaction. So um, things where you're dealing with bigger audiences, you want to bias towards automation and things where lower in the funnel, you want to obviously balance human interaction. And you can 
um, use scoring to determine how you should use each one of those levers. And finally, um, balance action ability with revenue. I kind of I referred to it earlier, but um, you want to um, have metrics all along the way that, that give you a, a fine-tuned signal of whether you should be moving a lever um, and if it's going to have an, an impact on revenue. So, um, Jeff, is it is it probably is it worth time to or is it worth taking some time to do some questions here? I see there's some stuff in the chat, or should we just keep moving on? I think uh, this question is a is a really really good one, uh, but I think it it it's more about how do you kind of manage models in practice. I, I think um, like where should logic sit? Should you manage logic and census? Should you pre-process data? Should you manage it in your downstream tool? Um, I think we can cover that one actually in, in greater detail a little bit later. Okay, that's great. Yeah, you're, Jeff is gonna be your guy to answer that question. He's knee deep, neck deep in this stuff pretty much every day. Um, so the first, uh, so I mentioned how to make a score. The first thing is simply just using that score and, and, and um, applying it to your accounts. So you, you just need um, a, a domain on every account and you need a score and simply uh, map it to, to the, the company's table and you get a nice report um, in, in the company's view in HubSpot. I think this seems pretty like not interesting, but what is really, really interesting about this is that you can give um, sales development representatives, you can give salespeople a, a quick way to prioritize all of their work in front of them. So they don't have to go into every little detail and say like, is this company the right size or in the right geography? If your scoring is roughly correct, it puts all of their prioritization into a single dimension. So they can just look at that and stay focused and work on doing sales uh, or, or customer success teams can just work on customer success. So um, I think, and additionally, I think the, the interesting thing that I've seen in the past is that once upon a time, I'd, I had done a score, I put it in Chartio, and um, I just noticed that nobody was ever looking, even though we put a link from the HubSpot, or I'm sorry, the Salesforce account interface so that um, they could just click a link and go to the filtered view in Chartio. Nobody ever clicks that link. People don't want to take that extra step just to get into the BI tool. So it's it's can be incredibly powerful and um and create a lot of leverage by having the, the data into the, the tools you actually use. Second one, I think probably the, the GA folks are most interested in this one um, is, is how you would put a domain score, or like put, a, put that uh, account score into work into sales or into Google Analytics. Um, and so going back to the customer or like the, the account model back here, we have different domains, we have scores on each ones and what what we do in Google Analytics is not put that score in because then you'd have to filter based on specific number criteria. But instead, I took it uh, and, and oops, put in, turned it into quintiles so with just like a case statement. So if it's in the top quintile, it's a high, very high likelihood to convert. If it's in the middle, it's medium, low, and very low um, at the bottom. And so with that, uh, I, I push that to Google Analytics. We use uh, Clearbit Reveal to get the data about where our uh, website visitors are, what what um, domain they come from, basically like what uh, company they be belong to because Clearbit does our IP lookup and says, okay, this person's probably from say um, Stumptown Coffee. And then with, Google, with Census, I can create a model that has both the domain and the qualification score or the qualification kind of um, quintiles. And then I compare that from Google, Google Analytics. So what, that, what you can do with that is then you can say, oh, I got all my users are, you know, I got like 20,000 users, but only 2000 of them are, are of any quality. You can then create segments off this and, and things you can do with that is you know, send that out to Google ads to create ads audiences off that, or you can compare your channels and say, okay, I got a paid channel, I got an organic search channel. What proportion of these is, um, which channels are bringing in a relatively high proportion of quality, uh, of company qualified traffic? And something that we saw, and I think anybody who's dealt with Facebook ads, 
you know, they, they kind of say our AI is so good that you just give us a really, really broad target. And over time we will narrow in and find the people who are most likely for, to convert for your, um, for your, your, your specific business. And so we tried that and we had something like, you know, 10,000 visitors. And I applied this kind of qualification model to Google analytics. I noticed that like only five, five, four, five percent of it was of any quality. And then you go over and look at like things like direct and it's like 10, 15% Google search to specific pages, 15, 20%. And um, it, it, it allows you to have signal way further out that is related to actual like a prediction of what what audiences are going to lead to revenue um, and allows you to make decisions about investing in certain channels way more intelligently than ha had you just been doing it blindly. And then far, finally, the third part is, is translating this, this score into, um, into Google Ads conversion. So as you know, I think everybody has looked at the conversions that have come in Google Ads and then trace those back basic, maybe on, on the time of day or something to the lead that it came into, or that it became in HubSpot and notice like certain campaigns bring in lots of leads, but they're like all students or um, they're, you know, not qualified. And so what this does is, is it one, it, it, it removes it, by doing kind of Google, uh, Google ads offline conversions, it allows you to stop worrying about maintaining pixels on your website and it allows you to qualify the conversions that you send to Google so long as you can, as you've captured the Google GCL ID. So the way that we do this is um, actually in HubSpot, every, uh, every contact, if they have clicked an ad has a GCL ID, uh, their most recent GCL ID. And if you're using Fivetran, uh, it will have a record of all the GCL IDs that they have. So you can just you send the first one, um, but, but you send it, send it, send the conversions back only when you have, when you have qualified, um, qualified conversions. So in this case, you know, Stumptown Coffee is 100% score or 100 out of 100 score, Heart Roasters is 54. And I, I think that these are, you know, it's indicative enough of becoming a conversion. So I wanna send those to Google Ads so that the ads manager can then continue to optimize for really high quality conversions. And I'm going to keep upper left roasters, which actually is good coffee out here in Portland. I'm I'm not going to con, uh, convert the lead from, or I'm not going to I'm not going to record the conversion from that company just because the quality is not indicative of um, of, of future kind of monetization. Jeff, I think like we were talking about this a couple of days ago, and and you had mentioned some some interesting use cases that customers were doing with Google Ads. As, Thought it'd be worthwhile to kind of sharing some of those. Yeah, I can definitely jump in here. Um, so as you've been saying, the goal here is how do you get better leading indicators of some business outcome, whether that's high LTV customers, um, leads that are actually going to convert back into these kind of more top of funnel um, uh, processes and tools. So for example, in the ad space, something that we see with server side or offline conversions, it might be something like the events that you have listed here. Like uh, if somebody has a SaaS product with a, a free version or a free trial, maybe you want to pass back whether or not they hit some sort of magic moment within their free trial. Um, so that way your ads folks can see not just what's driving signups or demo requests, but what's driving, which ads are driving um, are bringing in the folks that actually get the product, have a real need for the product and, and take that step. And those folks, that might even even be the, uh, the same criteria that you use to then mark, hey, this is a sales qualified lead for your sales team to then reach out. And as a consequence of this, now your, your marketing folks uh, on the ad side and your sales team are all pulling in the same direction. And your product folks as well are, are probably similarly trying to improve the product to make it easier to hit that moment as well. So it drives this unity across the different teams in this world. For more of a B2C case, uh, something that we, we sometimes see, if you, let's say you're a uh, D2C brand with a high return rate. So maybe it's a, you're an apparel company. Um, you can imagine people buy a lot of stuff up front and they return 
either a portion of that or all of that over the course of maybe a two week time period. Maybe you wanna follow up with an event back to uh, Google Ads saying, hey, this is actually the value of this customer um, after the returns. So you're, you're, you're saying, hey, these are the, the ad campaigns that bring in not just the customers that buy a lot of stuff up front, but the customers that keep a lot of stuff and have a real need for your product. Um, those are some examples in both B2B and uh, B2C worlds that we can sometimes see with offline conversions. Absolutely. And I think one, one other thing that we haven't actually mentioned here, but is really, really important is that um, with all the iOS updates that everybody has kind of lose, lost their head about um, with both uh, Google ads, Facebook ads, Twitter, what I, I don't know, we probably have a number of others, Jeff, um, that, that you can do offline conversions. So they don't, um, if people have opted out of tracking on their iPhone, you can still uh, record those conversions and where they came from, even you know, with without uh, worrying about cookies and everything like that. So m moving on, I probably should have talked about this slide basically when we were uh, when I was actually talking about, it, but just just to show that um, you would have a table about conversions and individuals individual conversions that you would join against a account qualifications table, the, the single model that I'd mentioned before. And then you would use this model to um, send your conversions out to Google, um, Google ads. Finally, I think like by far the absolute coolest thing that we have done recently with, um, with, with uh, ads for, for census is um, our LinkedIn ads integration, which uh, as many B2B, marketer, B2B marketers know, you can put in a list of um, target domains that you want to say like, I want to target people from Nike and Adidas and Reebok, let's say. Um, and you can target people from within those companies. And so in this case, I say like, I only want to target companies with a high, who have been my website or have a single lead um, from that company with a high or medium score. And I want to ignore the low ones and, and really focus my, uh, my ad spend on the places that are, it's going to be most, um, most, most effective. Um, and what's interesting about that is that you create one audience that is, is really, really big, but it's really targeted in terms of who you can, um, who is most likely to become a customer. And then within those audiences, you can say, I only want like specific personas. So I want people in, uh, in, in gosh, sales, marketing and support, but I don't want anybody who's there in an internship and I don't want to like target dogs. And so it allows you to get a lot more sophisticated, spend your efforts and your, and your ad spend a lot more efficiently. And so then you, it starts to be think, a question not about like how finally can I tune these levers in the ad platform, but how well can I uh, think, how well can I model my data from behind the scenes and enrich that data to, to create audiences that are, I'm confident will have a, have the right impact um, down the line. Where have I gone here? Going backwards now. Okay. So, so what I've, what I've shown here is, and I think Jeff put it really well is um, some, some, all of this, it starts from the same place. It's a, it's a reflection of what, what audiences, what customers, what people, um, what locations, whatever, uh, are most likely to lead to revenue. And you can, and you can show that as with broad, like, like broader, weaker signals, the further you go, but like the closer you get to revenue, you can have really tight signals. And then at the further out, you can have really broad signals, but they're a little bit weaker, but they still allow you to focus in on those that are likely to become a customer rather than all the, the noise out there that um, is unlikely to become a customer. So finally, I think the, 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 the big takeaway here is that as a marketer, as a marketing team, as a company, um, or as a, you know, as a marketing leader, you should think about, um, running big experiments. Now you have tools, not within just a single platform that promises you to run uh, uh, experiments across uh, the entire customer journey, but you, you can do it in a way that is consistent across your entire stack. So the first advice that I have for you is be thoughtful about metric design um, that matches growth, uh, growth levers to metrics. Um, so 
don't don't just use the metrics that tools provide to you. I think impressions, uh, clicks, conversion rate. Um, what you want to be thinking about is are these metrics? How likely are these metrics? How, how likely are these actions going to lead to revenue? And then design the metrics. Be thoughtful. Think. Use use the uh, smart data people you have at your company to to design metrics and trust them because this is all they do all day. Second one is um, even with perfect attribution or, um, or sorry, even without a perfect attribution or an event stream, you can trust your funnel because every metric is a reflection of revenue. So again, once you've created a model that suggests that there is a likelihood for every step of the way that people will continue to pass through, um, you don't have to worry about every single tracked detail. You can, you can kind of, have the liberty to think about, oh, well, if we use a brand campaign against this audience, we can, um, we, we can, we don't need to track every single interaction. We can just kind of trust that the changing the way they think is going to change the way they act, even if we don't see it specifically in the, um, because they kind of downloaded a white paper or something. Third one is experiment analysis and evaluation is consistent with your tools because you have the same source model. So, when you're targeting um, when you're targeting audiences based off a, a table of uh, of say dogs or people or companies, and then you're evaluating the revenue that's in the same table, you but for free you get consistency of, of how you evaluate those audiences and then the inputs you have to those audiences. So um, I think <laughs> the way I like to think about it, it's is therapy and diagnosis all in, uh, at once. So um, if you're into, it's like the good part of Theranos, you, you can, um, that's a bad joke. I'm just gonna move on with that. Um, and finally, um, get everybody involved when you can share a common language about your metrics. Um, you, can, you can bring more people into, into your experimentation. You have bigger levers to pull. Like Jeff said, you can think about using your product team um, because you can, you can give them reflections of metrics that you know will have an impact on revenue uh, and, and they will be aligned, aligned with the ads team, with the email automation team and all that. And so in the end, um, you will have to, it, it, it'll become less about like, what are the tactics that we're using, but how will I lead people to think uh, about what's possible? And I think the most exciting thing that's happening for me that I'm seeing happening with operational analytics is that we're removing a lot of the technical details that people have to focus on to do um, more interesting things. And so that people, uh, I think, I think I saw Steven in there um, in the chat earlier, um, folks like that are, are changing how they, how they think and how they lead because they have more capacity to, to lead rather than to focus on little details that may or may not um, have a lot of leverage. So I just talked over this slide in the last one, so I'm just gonna move forward. But basically, uh, it's just to illustrate that we, instead of having multiple touch points, you can think of it um, basically all modeled in your warehouse and then propagated to all, all to the, um, the, the external tools. Finally, we reached the end. Uh, I, I'm, I'm amazed that this many people stuck around for this long and I appreciate your, your ears. Um, Jeff, I think it's a, you know, it's a great time to, um, to address, oh, actually, I'm just gonna quickly mention this. I got my shirt on here, but um, right now, if, if any of you are interested, we're doing a, a, a fun little promotion where if you can start your census trial write a SQL model, uh, we will send to you a t-shirt of your, um, of your, of your liking. Um, we call it sync swag. Um, it was a result of, I think our first or second offsite, uh, as a company and, uh, hope you, hope you'll join into that. So that's it for me, Allie. What do we got? Awesome. Thanks for the presentation, Trevor. And thanks for all the participation in chat. Um, there are a few questions that came in. I know Jeff flagged early on that there was one he wanted to dive into. So I will just start kind of working our way through the questions queue and then make sure we uh, answer any of them that are hanging out in chat too. 
Um, so the first one was the original question from Josh on uh, does your model live in census alone or would you expect it to live in a similar or the same format within your data warehouse? Yeah, I can, I can definitely feel that one. This, this is a, um, a question that we see quite a lot as folks are beginning to adopt operational analytics, which the way I interpret it is like, should this logic live in, uh, like, should it live in HubSpot? Should it live in a SQL query in census? Or should it live in some data processing steps um, that generate like a table or a view? Uh, that lives in your, your data warehouse. And um, the TLDR is like, there is like an optimal path, uh, but pragmatism is oftentimes key here, as well as experimentation. So uh, what we typically see is folks start by either defining something really lightweight, uh, seeing if it's useful in a destination tool like HubSpot. So maybe you have some product metrics in there, product usage metrics. Um, Defining, hey, this is a uh, this is a lead score or an indicator of uh, this is a sales qualified lead. Seeing if that's a good indicator, and then starting to formalize that logic more and more upstream. So, for example, pulling that into a census model, um, which is just SQL. You can just write arbitrary SQL, and then saying, okay, this is actually becoming more and more mission critical for us, and pulling that then into upstream data processing. Um, Another kind of decision criteria as to whether or not to include this in census or versus in something a little bit further upstream is whether or not you're going to use this type of uh, value, not just for your operational analytics needs, but also maybe for data science purposes or for um, analytics cases in your BI tool. Having that kind of pulled a little bit upstream and pre-processed means that both census and any other query users are pinging from the same data set. But again, there's kind of a life cycle to consider when performing this. And um, pragmatism allows you to, to avoid making perfect the enemy of the good um, and only solidifying and version controlling, for example, putting heavier weight processes on things that you know are going to be referenced across multiple tools. Awesome. Thanks, Jeff. Oh. Yeah. Sorry, real quick, plus one on that. I think um, one thing that I came across in just, you know, uh, hacking a model together is that I it's easy to create a model that's that optimizes for high revenue customers versus likely high likelihood customers and Jeff's point about testing these metrics that should be leading indicators is a hundred percent on on point because um, depending you really want your metrics to align with whatever strategy you have in mind and you will find um, through the process of just like putting it out in the world that um, it does in fact do that or it doesn't do that. And my kind of uh, silly way of, of doing this is I named my neck metrics in HubSpot like really crazy thing. I call it Trevor's Wild West lead score to just really make the point that this is not like, I wouldn't yet trust this, um, but like if, you know, use it with your own risk. And as you continue to kind of like gain trust in those, you can formalize them and, and invest the engineering that kind of like really tunes them up. Awesome. Thanks for the additional context, Trevor. Um, sweet. And then also a follow-up from Josh. Uh, how do IP lookups work now via Clearbit uh, with so many folks working from home? That's a, a great question. Um, it's it's actually really interesting. Um, and I'll, I'll share a link in my in the kind of post email thing. Uh, th they will allow you to test. There, there's a URL that you can basically get whatever information they have about your IP address. But um, mobile is actually the bigger thing because uh, I just talked with Colin a clear bit last week to kind of like verify a lot of the things that I was talking about here. Um, and, and he says the IP addre addresses on mobile have a tendency to change quite frequently. So in those cases, you might strategically think about it's actually uh, capturing an email address is a little bit more important. Um, on desktop, you would be actually really shocked. I think there's a little bit of a delay. So when I moved from working at Panoply to working at Census, it took a handful of weeks to, to, to recognize that my apartment address was, um, uh, was like, or my specific IP address was Census versus Panoply. Um, but I find that like 
between my, my wife's computer and my own computer, I think we've seen different results too. So honestly, it's kind of magical. I would say I, over all of our traffic, I think we get probably 20% coverage and most of that's desktop, but like within that, you know, it, there's a lot of caveats about the nature of your traffic there, but um, you know, you can kind of use it to your own, uh, you, you use it for your own purposes. Anything to add there, Jeff? No, I'm very thankful that Trevor is knowledgeable about this topic. <laughs> For me, it's magic. It's magic to me. <laughs> I just, I just asked, asked this question one time. So, uh, but yeah, I think I'll, I'll send a link. You can des definitely test it for yourself. Awesome. Sweet. Uh, and then our next question is from Steven. Uh, Facebook recommends that you send them all conversions via the Facebook conversion API and let them handle the attribution. Have you tried comparing this to only sending them conversions that you attribute to Facebook? So I, I can definitely feel this one. This is a really, really interesting topic because there's two theories of mind here. There's one only tell Facebook about the conversions that I want it to know, in which case you actually have a little bit finer grain control. Um, and then there's also, hey, actually, I want to give it as much signal as possible. So that way, it's fancy machine learning algorithms can help optimize. In addition to our, our ads managers looking at, at the data coming in um, for uh, these are the campaigns that bring in uh, tons of people at this time, where they're from, and, and Facebook kind of micro targeting within the parameters that you've set based on providing it a lot of signals. Um, so I think the more common approach that I'm seeing is one of sending all data through the conversions API and uh, taking advantage of Facebook's AI-driven targeting, kind of micro-target on your behalf, sending wide parameters on your campaign, and then sending as much signal for Facebook to learn who's the best person to target and when. Um, typically, not just through a conversions pixel setup, but, or rather a conversions API setup through a redundant tracking setup. So you have your, your conversion pixel fire, and then within the next two days, following up uh, via the, the conversions API with, hey, here's, here's all of our list of conversions, allowing Facebook to either dedupe, saying, hey, we know about this one, or hey, these are new ones that uh, because of iOS 14 or because of app blockers and the like, we didn't know about, and then allowing them to, to do the attribution. Um, this, of course, is a very different topic like, than doing kind of a more robust multi-touch attribution analysis. This is much more in the vein of how do I get as much information into Facebook for, it to, for you to optimize your campaigns versus kind of looking for the, the perfect sense of truth of what led to what. Um, and I think it's important to kind of separate those, those two use cases in mind. I think for more sophisticated multi-touch attribution, um, that's still best done outside of, or not a lot, not, not totally trusting Facebook or any of these individual tools who will say, this person looked at their phone in the last, uh, in the last hour, or they sniffed their phone. Um, we're going to attribute this conversion to, to an ad that they scrolled past on accident. Um, but at the end of the day, it seems like it's boosting attribution rates and helping folks to target their customers more effectively um, from an operational sense. Just to add on that, you can you can explicitly dedupe too, right? You can have conversion IDs that will do that. Um, and I think what's another thing that's interesting to me about moving to an offline conversion world is that you can kind of stop thinking about like Facebook is trying to pull the wool over your eyes with overly um, attributing kind of conversions to view through. Um, but you can say, I acknowledge Facebook's got their own worldview and um, I'm going to, to use Facebook in the way that is like actually more influential and not always conversion oriented to say like, this is awareness. This is like messaging that's going to influence behavior down the line and seeing if that then, um, kind of roundabout non click type stuff, just view, uh, view through type stuff has an effect ultimately on the offline conversions that you send after the fact. So a lot of this stuff is frankly, changing the way I think about what effective digital marketing is because 
um, the metrics as we've, you know, it's always been happening. Like we lost keywords in Google analytics like 10 years ago and everybody in SEO was like, Oh shit, we can't do this anymore. But it's like, every time there's a change, it just makes you have to think, change that paradigm slightly um, in a way that's more effective today. Awesome. Thank you both. Um, so next up for questions is the one from Chris. Uh, can you backdate the conversion timestamp even if you're currently outside of the conversion event window for that conversion? So um, sadly, we're all still beholden to the conversion windows um, that have set up. But there are, this is not necessarily like a, uh, a nail in the coffin for this approach. There's um, so it means that we have to get a little bit creative and take advantage of leading indicators as much as we can and identifying those leading indicators for, for maybe later events as much as we can. So for example, um, let's say you're a SaaS product, you have a long sales cycle. Uh, maybe that takes longer than 90 days, uh, which, which is the longest that conversion window that you can set up in, in Google Ads. Um, maybe you can look for signals that occur much sooner that have higher, um, that, that correlate with success, at least to improve your targeting. So better is better for sure. Uh, so in this case, it could be something along the lines of like only like send conversions of uh, folks uh, when folks sign up with a business domain email address or um, that they completed their onboarding flow uh, itself. These things even though that might not necessarily be the, the ultimate conversion or the furthest down funnel indicator that you can, uh, you can, you would love to optimize for, it still correlates more highly with success than um, maybe something that's more readily trackable by the front end. Sweet. Thank you, Jeff. Um, and then our last question that we have in chat is from Saras. Uh, can we use this model to decide between higher customer support versus lower consumer cost? So uh, the nice thing about this kind of scoring model is you could also, you can incorporate as many inputs as you'd like into this. If this is kind of what your, your business is pulling towards, it's almost like a fully weighted profitability uh, metric and you have the data to back it up then that's absolutely something that you could incorporate into, into this type of score. Um, so for sure, yeah. I'm, typically that ends up happening at a, a, a high level of maturity. You need a lot of data and you need a lot of information about who churns, when they churn, or uh, customer lifetime value. Um, but you can definitely bake that in into a kind of, not just an expected LTV or expected chance of conversion, but maybe like, a expected, um, yeah, expected lifetime value or expected profitability style of, uh, of score. Awesome, thank you very much. Um, last call on questions as I kind of like wrap us up with some closing information here. Um, thanks again to everybody who has participated and watched today and to Trevor and Jeff for all of their knowledge as always. Um, as we mentioned at the top, uh, we'll be doing kind of a follow-up event. Uh, Trevor will be doing an AMA in our community, the Operational Analytics Club. Um, if you're not already a part of it, you can join at uh, operationalanalytics.club, uh, and, and we will also send over a link uh, with some instructions and everything to register in our follow-up email along with Trevor's deck. Um, and we will send out a link uh, to the recording of this webinar, too, if you want to watch back on anything Trevor discussed or share it with anybody who you think it might be useful. Um, but yeah, thank you everybody uh, for your time today and for your participation and we will see you in the community and see you next time for our next webinar. Thanks everybody. Join us. <laughs> Take care.